excited to see everyone here. My name is Dion Zell. I'm the Associate Vice President for Academic Technology. And without further ado, I'm going to turn it right over to get the show rolling to Hillary Baker, who is our Vice President for Information Technology. Good morning. This is a great day. Glad to see so many of you here today. And it really, I'm here to welcome us to the sixth annual e-learning showcase where our CSUN faculty re really reveal their newest technology, teaching and learning innovations. We have a great showcase uh, for you all here today. And um, especially want to focus that this is the first time that we have a, the Academic Technology e-Learning Group and the Office of Student Success Innovations really joining forces, joining together um, to bring the best in teaching and learning innovations at CSUN. And it's just a proud moment and it's a great um, collaboration effort between academic affairs and IT and I love to see those every time we can um, have issue, uh, items such as today. So we're going to start this morning with um, the focus on the e-learning showcase. We're going to follow that up with lunch with the keynote speaker, uh, Dr. Tia Brown McNair, and we're so glad to have you here today. Um, and then this afternoon with the academic innovation showcase. Our Master of Ceremonies this morning is Dr. Kenneth Luna, Associate Professor and Chair in the Department of Linguistics and Teaching English as a Second Language. Uh, Ken also share, serves with us as an academic technology fellow. And for those that don't know, our faculty fellows are faculty who work closely with the Faculty Technology Center to guide and support their peers in adopting new learning technologies. We're so pleased that Ken can serve in that role. We're always open to hear of other faculty interested in doing that, so I'll mention the plug there too. And I will at this point pass you over to Ken, it's all yours. Thank you so much, um, Hillary. I'm really excited to be here. Um, this is the sixth year that we have this e-learning showcase. And it is the event of the year. For me, it is the event of the year. This is from faculty, you know, showcase, showcasing a showcase from faculty for faculty, showcasing what we do best. Teaching, helping our students, and helping our students succeed, okay? I'm always amazed with uh, everything that my colleagues are, are doing. And every single year, I learn something new. And I'm, I'm always in awe. Okay, so thank you for being here. So let's get started, but before we get started, we want you to be involved in this showcase. We want you to be par participants in the showcase. So we want you to go to, pull, to go to this address, pull your devices, any device that has access to the internet, your uh, smartphone, tablet, laptop, and please go to this address, pollev.com slash poll. okay? And you will see a question there that we would like you to answer, okay? pollab.com slash poll, and you will see a question, okay? So for the question, the question is, what does innovation in higher education look like to you? But please only use one word. We want you to only use one word, okay? And if you don't remember the address, it's right there, pollab.com slash CSUN, and it should also, CSUN poll, and it's also in your um, program. What does innovation in higher education look like to you in one word? And we see some of the words that you are entering, being populated here, it's creating a word cloud. We have, okay, engagement, that's what a lot of people are saying, that's the biggest word, very good, empowering, nice. Efficient, excellent, technology, well, everybody is engagement, that's, that's good, that's, you know, innovation. Creativity, very good. Let's see what else you come, okay, engagement, creativity, empowering. Collaboration, excellence, those are the biggest words. That's great. So what we're going to do is, thank you for participating, but you're gonna keep on participating during the showcase, okay? What we want you to do is we want you to use this tool to ask questions for the presenters. As we go through the showcase, we will remind you of, uh, of Polev, so please go there, ask questions for the presenters. At the end, we're gonna have a quick you know, question and answer sec uh, session. Um, and we'll pull questions from, um, I'll be pulling questions from pollev.com. Um, so please, and also important, remember, if you ask a question, please put the presenter's name so then we know who the question is addressed to, okay? So we'll be reminding you about this periodically, okay? So now, with, without further ado, let, let's get started. Our first presenter is Joyce Marie Brusasco, 
from the Department of Child and Adolescent Development and Family and Consumer Sciences with her presentation, Connecting with Students to Promote a Sense of Belonging. Good morning. Yes, you can hear me. Fantastic. Hello, I'm Joyce Marie Brasosco from Child and Adolescent Development and Family and Consumer Sciences. Thank you so much for having me. I actually took the eLearning Institute last summer and I learned a lot of tools in order to um, use in the classroom over the last year. So I want to share those tools with you today. Um, I also did a little bit of information about um, some challenges that you guys all know that we've been doing here on campus, which is challenging us with our DFU students our students who are in our classrooms who end up getting DFUs. I actually teach two of those classes. I teach the ADV 150, which is a freshman class, and I also teach Family Consumer Sciences 340, which is marriage and um, family relations. Um, so I, I integrated and I used a lot of the e-learning institute techniques in these classes this last semester because we know that um, we need to allow students to actually um, matriculate to the next semester. So one of the things I focused in on is the sense of belonging. So out of some research, I've done a lot of research on the sense of belonging um, in uh, higher ed. So the research tells us that the extent to which students see themselves as part of the campus community is really, really important. And they feel that they belong on the campus community and they feel a great sense of connection on the campus community. And really, that's our job as faculty to help students, because we are the face of CSUN in many inst instances, um, to help students actually feel a sense of community in the classroom and actually here on campus. And we could do that um, in a couple different ways by supporting the students on their peer-to-peer -peer type of support and actually um, support in the classroom. So I used a couple different techniques um, to help students in uh, all of my classes. So they had up a few of my uh, campus classes. So in just a few minutes, I'm going to just walk through these three bullet points. Learning students' um, names was a strategy I used a variety of different ways. Um, building connections, not only in the classroom, but um, outside the classroom as well. And working in um, classroom online and um, in the class. So the first one, learning strategies, is I actually use Canvas. And thanks to Ken, I learned a new technique in using Canvas. It's called Name Coach. And um, I have, at the beginning of the semester, I have the students actually record their names. And it's actually very helpful. So this is my Canvas page. I had a student by the name of this name. Anybody want to guess how you would pronounce H-E-R-M-I-N-E? Hermione, obviously. Her Hermione, obviously, like Harry Potter. Well, that's not true. That's not how you pronounce her name. So that's good for me to know before I uh, actually walk into the classroom to do the whole roster. Let's see hey, Nina. Her name is Hermione. Her Hermione. So say I even got it wrong now. It's, it, it takes a little while to get it off your tongue. Hermione. Hermione. Stapionia. Okay. So that was very helpful for me to actually get to know the names before I actually went into the classroom to do the roster. That was one strategy I used. Another one to building um, connections that I learned was actually doing um, this video discussion forum in Canvas. Um, I created this video discussion um, to allow the students, so I recorded myself um, introducing the discussion. Um, and then I wanted the students to apply the material back to themselves. I do teach um, basically birth to death, so there's lots of opportunities for us to share a little bit about ourselves. So I created this video um, to share a little bit about myself so that they can actually talk about their experiences as children as well, physical, cognitive, and social, emotional. So I'm just going to show you 14 seconds of a video that I created to help with the sense of belonging so that they know a little bit about me. Um, so uh, the, the one thing I want you to uh, see in this video too is that it is actually in my home. <laughs> so it is a bookshelf in the back of my house. Or in, right. Anyway, I hope you guys have fun with this assignment. I hope you learn a little bit about each other. Um, this way, we don't have to come to class on the week of Thanksgiving. So here are my point shoes. So what I did is I shared a little experience about myself. Is in high school, I was actually on point or had point slippers. And so this was a really great opportunity for the students to learn a little bit about me and then um, comment to each other and learn some more about themselves as well. So I created that video. And then lastly, the working in the groups and in the classroom online is um, this. I use some old school techniques as well that are just old school, or table tents, right? Um, but I have an opportunity to use a variety of different colors. Um, one class I do teach is an intro, uh, is a, 
a class that all family and super sciences students have to take. So I've divided them up, green is nutrition, pink is fashion, and so on. Um, but I use this technique to easily put them into groups, either separate them into a variety of different groups and colors, or I put them all in the same. One thing that we noticed is that students don't actually know each other's names. And this is a great way for them to actually learn each other's names, and they actually take a lot of classes together as well. So sometimes they sit in the same class and they don't always know their same names. So I use that old school technique, as well as um, participating in group activities and posting their PowerPoints, coming together and having a collaborative uh, work environment outside of the classroom, as well as posting their PowerPoints, reacting to each other's um, information as they post it. So what this does is it allows for, for me, what it allowed for is peer communication. Um, it allows for the students to collaborate. It allowed for engagement not only on my part but also on their part with the e-learning um, e institute techniques. The identity development, they got to compare themselves to other students by writing up their videos and working in groups and comparing themselves as far as their knowledge base and whatnot. So some identity development and actually success in the coursework to again look at how they compare to each other. So the takeaways are um, learning students' names. It's actually not that hard, but you do have to work at it. You have to make a conscious effort to actually learn their names, and, and clearly, Hermione still doesn't come completely off my, uh, off my tongue. Um, sharing personal stories. When we share personal stories, we know that faculty can actually engage in some sort of um, uh, engagement with them and create our humanisticness of, as faculty. And then lastly, allowing them the opportunity to do peer-to-peer -peer interactions in a variety of different ways, online, in the classroom, um, and also do, they all had to respond to each other's videos too. So that's what I did, and we have a whole table left of uh, all sorts of other uh, faculty, so thank you, Ken. Thank you so much, Joyce Marie. Um, your focus on learning the correct pronunciation of students' um, of students' names is critical in uh, building connections and a sense of belonging. And as a linguist, actually, and coincidentally, as a phonetician, I believe this is essentially making them feel at home. I also liked how you're basing your strategies on actual research and literature on the subject, which we should all be doing as academics. So great, thank you. Remember pollab.com slash CSUN. Um, Paul, for questions. Next up, we have a video from Lisa Ricamini from Academic First Year Experiences with her video um, showcasing student work in the virtual freshman celebration with Portfolio. The Freshman Celebration is a two-day event that we hold every fall and it takes place both in the room and also there's a virtual component to it. The in the room projects are oftentimes displays, posters, and then the virtual project is the different multimedia projects that they can submit to Portfolio. Portfolio is used in Virtual Freshman Celebration as a way to put all their projects together in sort of a clear, concise format. For this project, I decided to do a, a video. Me and my team really wanted to express in a video how everyone has problems and everyone has their own success story. How is that, Mama? Sí, sí, todo bien. Este, pues sí, aquí echando la ganas. It's like a medium to show all your success and your experiences. Portfolio allows them to help develop their online identity as professional students, and then over the course of the years, how they grow from there, what their arc is. So at the end of it, potential employers can see, wow, look at that learning curve. If they can do that here, imagine what they can do for my company. The freshman celebration was a like project on Portfolio. I had a deal with the book that we read in that class. We had to like apply to how we related to the book. A lot of people get to see my projects I put out there. Um, I get a lot of feedback and you can connect with other people. I, I like that, it's pretty nice. Faculty who have traditionally done in the room projects are now looking at perhaps submitting portfolio projects next year. Because they have seen the energy that is around Portfolio, they've seen students be engaged in each other's projects, and they also realize that this is part of helping students develop their online persona you know, for the long term over their academic career.
hearing students' voices about their experiences at CSUN is very, very powerful. And not only does it give them agency in showcasing their work and their lives as students, but also having that e-portfolio prepares them for their careers and lives beyond CSUN, okay? Remember Polev? Next up, we have another presenter. We have Sochi Flores Marcial from Chicano Chicano Studies with using video to engage students and illustrate concepts with Zoom. Good morning, thanks for coming today. I'm going to show you one of the tools that I found so helpful in engaging with students in my online teaching. And so today I'm going to talk to you about three very particular ways in which I use Zoom in my online classroom. Uh, Zoom is so flexible, you could really tailor it to the way that you might need in your own teaching style. So Zoom allows me to do several things, and so I'm going to pick, I'm only going to talk about three. I, I'm sorry, I use Zoom to make really brief introductions of the modules. So for every lesson, for example, we have um, some learning goals. And so I introduce the learning goal. I say, this is the question that we're going to answer at the end of this module. I also allow a space or these other very short, brief introductions to guide them through the content in the Canvas module. So I use screen share to actually go through the content. And the most uh, useful that I have found in terms of engaging with students and we know that students are commuting from very distant places we know that they have so many different responsibilities so the virtual office hours has been an incredible help and I'm going to show you a little bit of, of how this works and what I do uh, so I always encourage my students to go beyond what is on the screen. So in this case, I'm introducing uh, the concept of the uh, Clovis culture and Clovis points. And so I say, just plug this into Google, find out what more is behind this. I use the screen share option to show them some of the papers that they're going to read. And because it's a screen share, I can highlight, for example, terms in the paper that they're reading that they should really look at, that they should really focus on, that they should really think about and put in their notes for their quizzes or uh, their assessments. The screen share option is such a great way to do things such as you get to navigate online. Um, I have lots of maps to show them, you know, this is taking place here. And so we have, uh, you know, we're reviewing the course materials, but I'm actually online looking at the ways in which I'm uh, searching for these terms, pointing at these uh, very strategic points in the map that they can do at the same time if they want to, but they don't have to. It's just a, a brief introduction, so guiding them through that but here's one of the magical uh, ways in which I use Zoom, and this is meeting with students. So we know that it is already challenging for many of our students to come to office hours. Uh, you know, they feel hesitant, they don't really know what to do in office hours, what are office hours. So what I've been doing is I, I send out an email and I say, look, I can help you with your paper, I can help you with your research. How about we meet through Zoom? We can do a five minute or a 10 minute meeting depending on your availability. And I show them, for example, and I, I chose this particular way uh, to uh, work together on a research project. The screen share option allows me to show them at the same time and so in some ways it's almost better than uh, meeting with a student in your, in your uh, office in, in the sense that, you know, sometimes a student is, is sitting on the other side of your desk, so they don't really know what is going on on your computer, but here they know exactly what you're doing at exactly the same time. And as you can see, so here's my screen, if you can find the student. She can see me, I can see her. Uh, something that's also pretty great is that um, the student doesn't have to be on a laptop, they can, they can be on their phone. Hi. I'm pushing the buttons too fast, I think. Hi, Michelle, how's it going? I'm well. Okay, so let's do this quick.
quick research um, on Sabotech history. Everything that I do on my screen, you can see. We're looking into Dekio projects. If we go on WorldCat and we do that kind of topic search, um, we can write Dekio, we can write Sabotech, and see what comes up. So just a really quick, brief um, example of what they can see while I'm doing this research. She could see the paper that I was working on at exactly the same time. We were doing a uh, find, you know, the find option to find those terms. And the, the, the student was pretty impressed. So what did the students say? This is, this is real feedback from the students. This is one of my engineering students. This is one of my master students, and so the master student was about to start writing their thesis, and you know they said, I, I don't know how to get started. I don't know what to say in my introduction. I don't know what, you know, I have all this information. And we used uh, Google Docs, and we used the screen share option, and so I said, okay, type up a sentence, just whatever you want to say, just type it up, and then let's, let's start from there. And they just thought, wow, I had no idea we could do this. And we were working on the same document, you know, um, live in, in real time. And they were pretty impressed. And then the students who, who, who have those challenges, uh, you know, coming to campus and meeting um, based on, you know, our difficult schedules, uh, faculty and students, it's often, you know, we, we cannot find a time to meet. And so in the last um, comment, this was a student who was driving 50 miles away. Uh, they, I think we're driving from Lancaster, but I also had a student who was driving from Victorville. And if I remember well where Victorville was, I think I remember it somewhere like toward Vegas somewhere. So they were driving from Victorville to come take their courses all in one day. So they were arriving very early in the morning and leaving very late at night. And so this tool really allowed me to connect with the students to find a space that really, you know, worked for both and, and to do the kind of work together um, that, you know, we could do, of course, in person. But this is, it, it's like you kick it up a couple notches. And it's pretty great. It's very powerful. And I highly recommend it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sochi. Um, wow. OK. I mean, Zoom is a really, really powerful tool. And I've actually used it. You see it in action in something like virtual, soft, virtual office hours. And I've actually used it in my own classes, and the students really like it. The student comments are just incredible. I mean, this is what it's all about, right? Um, and I really love the story about the student who was driving from Victorville, from Lancaster, and how you can serve students who live far away and whose life situations may not allow them to come to campus, right? And that's really important. So thank you so much, Sochi. Okay, Polev, remember for any questions. Next up, we have another video from Nancy Carr from the Department of Business Law with leveraging Canvas analytics to help students succeed. When I teach a course, my focus is always on the students and how successful they can be. So first I want to make sure that I'm providing everything to them that will help them be successful. Do they have all the information? Do they have all the grades? Do they have all of the resources? Then the second piece is for me to get the information that I need. So looking at the analytics so that then I can either change what I'm doing in the classroom or to see that there are students I need to follow up with. The way Professor Carr utilizes its tools is very, very helpful um, in terms of keeping the class very, very structured. I have a Canvas set up so that I, uh, every time something is graded, it comes to my email. Uh, I open it up and I see what the grade was. Uh, I see the criteria. She has to really well explain the criteria that she wants on every brief. I look at the gradebook and see how students have done on maybe a particular exam or a quiz or something like that. Up in the top, there's a little drop down arrow and it says message students who. I could message students who performed above an 
you know, every now and then students just need a little boost, you know, to know that somebody's noticing that they are doing well. With the message students who performed below a certain grade, then I can offer that they can come to my office, we can chat about where they might have gone wrong or offer them additional resource or, you know, just something to let them know it's not a reprimand, it's not a punishment, but let me know how I can help you now so that you'll perform better the next time. And under the assignment, she has a comment. And she just makes sure that I understand the context of the assignment and just do the right thing for the next time. So I've actually noticed that I understand the class much more. It's a very difficult subject to grasp, but with Canvas, there's links, there's tips, and it has helped me improve my grades. You know, certainly the Canvas analytics are so helpful so that I can adjust my teaching to either change the quiz question or to repeat something that I taught in class that maybe everyone didn't grasp. So those Canvas analytics really help me to help the students be more successful. Thank you so much, Nancy. Um, one of the things I really like about um, Nancy's story is how she's found ways to use e-learning um, to communicate with her students by providing personal feedback and, most importantly, intervene before it's too late for her students, okay, which is really important, and perhaps give them that extra push that they need towards the end or any point during the semester. Okay, so thank you so much, Nancy. Next, uh, remember Polev questions and remember to include the presenter's name. Now we have two presenters. Amy Correa Rowe and Darla Anderson from the Department of Communication Studies with saving students money by creating a cost-free e-text in Canvas. Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm from the Department of Communication Studies where the challenge that we faced was how to create a cost-free speaking textbook um, for our students. Um, so we, um, we teach approximately 60 sections of this GE requirement every semester. So that's about 3,000 students a year. So we have quite a um, number of students who are coming through this class. Um, so our solution was to uh, work with affordable learning solutions um, to replace our current textbook with a cost-free solution. So how did we go about doing that? Uh, we, uh, we worked with librarian um, and, and folks from the Cal State to get um, funding uh, through the AB 798 grant, and the Chancellor's Office also offered um, ALS funding. Um, we combined resources to build this textbook using open education resources, OER, uh, free online um, textbooks, as well as fair use portions of existing textbooks that we were already using for this class. Um, and ultimately, we delivered um, this uh, free textbook through the uh, Canvas platform. Oh, yes. <laughs> okay, who was involved in this uh, process? Um, from the Department of Communication Studies, um, I serve as the basic course director. So that means I teach and supervise all of the TAs who teach approximately 24 sections of this class um, every semester. Um, Darla Anderson and Denise Lorette are um, lecturing faculty who have been teaching um, COMS 151, the, the basic course, the public speaking course, for a number of years. So we were the COMS faculty. Um, we worked with um, Isabel Ramos and um, Lori Bouchard um, from, the, um, from the library, from the Oviat uh, Library ALS project. And we also work with the um, instructional designers from the Faculty Technology Center. Okay, so um, I'm Darla Anderson, and uh, so how did we come about getting this textbook? Well, fortunately, there's lots of resources out there. It, we did this about a year ago, and as I understand, there's actually been more places to search for uh, OER materials. We use Merlot OER Commons. We also use copyrighted material, and, and under fair use, you can use 10% of the entire text. And then we also were able to, um, you're able to use permalinks that allow you to access the library's holdings. So this means you can um, make articles or books available to students in Canvas. You just put the permalink on a page, and they're able to go through and use that material. And we ended up with a textbook from a variety of sources. We use mainly from Stand Up, Speak Up, and public, ser uh, uh, 
yeah, public speaking project because those were open source materials. So much of the book comes from that, or the textbook that we have available. Um, we also used regular traditional uh, textbooks because they had specified material that, that was particular to what we wanted to do and we had assignments and, and materials built around that. So for example, the Cindy Griffith book is a book that has sorry, information about um, invitational speaking. So we used a portion of that under the fair use doctrine. And it came all together and this is our course, this is our home page, and we use the module system that the learning designers suggest and the students go from there to each of these modules that are, it's a 30 module system, so if you're teaching the class twice a week or once a week, it's easy to adapt to that and then we've, this gives you two examples of the modules. So we have a discussion forum, which uh, we have the materials available and then the students engage in the discussion forum, or this is typical of when we have a reading. So we have all, I mean, I'd love to talk about all those materials that we put together because it takes so long and you really wanna share it with everyone, right? But you can see we have intro pages, keywords, the study guides, as well as the text. And the text is available as a PDF. This is how the students see this, and we have the, you know, the entire textbook for the class. They're able to read it online if they want to, or they can download it, or they can print it out. So you know, we all have our own way of wanting to look at material, and this allows students all that options. So once we got the text up, then what happened? Amy's gonna tell you about that. So what ended up happening with our financial situation for our students, um, Starting in the summer of 2017, last summer when we began this project, um, Darla and Denise were piloting the project, which was perfect because we finished it in the, in the late spring and we uh, piloted it in the summer. So they were teaching 40 students. Um, then I piloted it with my TAs um, that last fall and I trained them on Canvas and they were able to import um, that material into their own Canvas pages and they did it again in the spring but then the word got around to our, our faculty so then some of the faculty started to adopt it. So overall, um, over 1,400 students now have used this um, free online textbook. Um, so what that has meant for these 1,400 students is that instead of spending $150 on a textbook, collectively they saved over $200,000. Um, instead of spending $50 just renting a textbook, they saved over $70,000. Instead, 1,400 students spent $0. So that was a, a tremendous <laughs> saving for us. Um, this right. is what they said about it. Right. So this is tip. We actually also built in Canvas um, an assessment tool, a course survey at the end to ask them about how they like Canvas and the textbook. So this was very typical, I'd like to say, of the comments we got about having the, I mean, who wouldn't want something for free, right? They were giving out the free um, Scantrons and books you know, in, outside of the library today. So, and you generally get the comment at the beginning of the class when you say, guess what? The textbook is free, it's online. And for the teacher, the instructor, it's also a wonderful thing because instead of having students say, oh, I don't have the textbook, it hasn't come in yet, it's right there. As soon as they, you open up your Canvas course, it's right there and you can jump right in and start in with the, the class and start with their readings and everything. So where do we go from here? As um, Amy pointed out, we only have had about half of the sections using it, so it's still a matter of rolling out this idea, letting faculty know that it's available. Where really it's just been one year, so it's still a work in progress and finding out what is most effective. Um, but it seems to be working pretty well. And if it's something that you're interested in doing, the affordable learning solutions, they're taking grant applications right now, so this is your time to sign up and maybe get some assistance for that. And even if you don't get that, um, there are, they're available for you to help develop your own um, on, open educational resource. And we hope you have as much success as we did. Thank you. This is a perfect example of what the Affordable Learning Solutions Initiative can do, okay? So there's money out there, so please apply and use these opportunities. 
And if you're interested in something like this, I'm gonna point out, Ding back there in this table is raising her hand, okay? Just make sure that you capture during lunch if you're interested in this. Um, it's amazing how much money you save our students and imagine if we can replicate this in many of our classes and take advantage of these opportunities. Imagine how much money, how much more money we could save our students, okay? Remember Polev for questions? We have another video coming up from Ellie um, Kazemi from the Department of Psychology with improving behavioral therapy training using a robot simulation. So we've been doing some research where um, kids with self-injury, for example, have to uh, be across with a therapist who does these assessments with them. It's difficult to teach these assessments with real children, whereas the robot self-injures without real injury. We had to learn how to program. We had to learn how to observe behavior even better than um, then it was required for the job, so to a whole different level. As soon as I heard Dr. Kazemi was working with simulated clients that were exhibiting problem behavior of a child, I totally jumped on the project and I wanted to join lab. And then also for ethical reasons, we're able to use the robot to tackle research questions that we may not otherwise be able to tackle. So if you think of the interaction of a child and a caregiver, if I'm giving them performance feedback, the child may also behave differently under those conditions. So you don't know if the feedback is affecting the child or the therapist that you're working with. Whereas with the robot, he's not affected by the feedback I provide the participant. I'm able to study how to give that feedback to be effective. You kind of start testing the capacity of the robot and what you're able to do with him. And then you start sparking new ideas. So it's a lot of thinking about creative ways to go around doing specific things. So it's really fun. I like to think that it does have personality. like. Um, with the research we've been conducting, looking into human-robot interaction, we've definitely been including like emotional aspects. I want cars. Okay. Here you go. Oh, I'm gonna read over here. You play with that. I hope the future of this line of research is that um, other people will see the utility because there's so many questions we could answer. So I'm hoping that it'll stimulate some interest elsewhere and other people will begin to study um, using the robot. Thank you so much, Ellie. And this is a prime example of the innovation, the kind of innovation that's happening at, C at CSUN. Not only is this mind boggling, but it's all about providing our students with real world application of the skills acquired while, us, while, while here with us at CSUN, okay? Remember Polev for any questions? Now we have another live presenter, Grishma Bafsar from the Department of Health Sciences with creating online interactive lecturettes with, with H5P. Good afternoon, everyone. Today I'm gonna to be talking to you about my class, Health Sciences 314. Uh, it's called Organization and Delivery of Health Services. And it's an introductory upper division course with mostly juniors and a mix of public health and health administration students. We teach four sections of this course every semester with somewhere between 30 to 35 students per semester or per section. And I've converted this course to be fully online and asynchronous, meaning that students don't have to log in at any particular time. They kind of take, do the class at their own time. So I started teaching this course in the face-to-face, -face, very traditional manner. It was two hour, 45 minute lecture. Um, and I used different strategies and techniques for engagement in the class that I learned through faculty development. So I used self-knowledge checks where I checked in with students using Poll Everywhere like we're doing right now to make sure that students were understanding the material. I used exit tickets to figure out what students thought were the muddiest points, what they thought the most important points were in the lecture, and we just did low tech on index cards at that point. I used think, pair, share, where students thought about a question that I posed to them. They'd work in small groups or in pairs, and then they'd share out to the entire class. And then lastly, I used the jigsaw method for things like if, what are the 10 
characteristics of the healthcare system. And then I'd break them up into 10 different groups. They'd work together in their little groups and then report back to the entire class. So I redesigned this course in the summer of 2016 after taking the e-learning institute to be fully online at that point. And I learned a lot of great strategies and tools from the e-learning institute. But the key takeaway for me was that I needed to find the right tool for the instructional strategy that I was using. So I wanted to convert my lectures into what I call lecturettes. Take those two hour, 45 minute lectures and convert them into 15 to 20 minute lectures. Because no one has the time, to, the time or the attention span to really focus for two hours and 45 minutes on a video. Unless it's, you know, an Avengers video or something like that. <laughs> um, so I condensed the material down to those 15, 20 minute lectures and I use Camtasia to do that and then all of the rest of the material I use different activities on canvas like assignments and quizzes and discussion forums to really engage them, them with the material. So this is what my process was. I use Camtasia to record my video, whether that be just a voiceover on slides or the slides with my face on it. Um, I edited to remove any mistakes because we all have the ums and uhs through the recording. Then I animated and highlighted any key points to really stress what was important in the lectures. I added closed captioning to be ADA compliant. And then I uploaded the video to YouTube, and that allowed me to put it right into Canvas. But at the end of the day, it was still a boring video that people had to watch. And they could sleep through it, they could watch it without paying attention, and so I needed something a little bit more. That's where H5P came in. It allowed me to make the videos more interactive. And H5P has a ton of different widgets that you can use, but the one that I'm gonna be talking about is the interactive video. That's the feature that I used. H5P allowed me to ask questions in the middle of my video. So I could ask multiple choice questions, fill in the blank questions. I could link to other content on the web and students had to answer those questions while watching the video. So they couldn't fall asleep while watching my videos anymore. I was able to embed these new videos right into Canvas and the best part was that it's completely free to use H5P, it's open source software. And so this is what it might look like in Canvas. This is my video embedded. Students would hear a little something from my video like this. And lastly, we have outcome measures. These have to do with the ultimate outcome of the process or the results of healthcare services and the experiences of care. And then the video would pause. I would ask them to do this activity. So the question is, what type of measure is this? <laughs> They'd pick process structure, outcome, and in real time, they'd know if, the, if they answered that question properly. And then they'd move on with the lecture or get asked more questions. Now, overall, this was a great tool. H5P and Camtasia were a lot of fun to learn, but it is very time consuming to sit down and record these lectures and figure out where exactly I need the interaction. Um, but the return on investment is huge. Students absolutely love it. The feedback I get on course evaluations is always, this is such a good online class because I get to watch videos. I don't just have to do reading because um, we all know students don't necessarily love the reading part of it. Uh, it actively engages the students while watching these videos rather than passively watching the lecture videos. And they get these low stake knowledge checks. So they don't really have to worry about getting points for getting things wrong. They can check themselves to make sure they're understanding the material while they're going through the lecture. And that's it for me. So this is really interesting because some people tend to think that online classes, right, are not engaging, not, in, not interactive, not rigorous enough. Thank you, Grishma, for showing us that this is a misconception and it's really not relevant in today's world with today's students, okay? In addition, another thing that I, that I really like is how you leverage the power of technology to choose the right tool for an instru instructional strategy, and that's very important. Thank you. Polev? Next up, we have a video from Mariano Losacol from the Department of Bio Biology, who's also an academic technology fellow and the lead for our um, artificial intelligence exploration. 
um, with a video exploring artificial intelligence innovation for faculty and students. So AIX stands for Artificial Intelligence Exploration and it's an initiative that we're taking here at CSUN to try and um, start exploring what uses AI could have. When you're engaging a computer and you stop realizing or remembering that you're dealing with a computer, that's when you're dealing with AI. There is uh, many projects going on here at CSUN related to AI. Uh, some of them have to do with how we connect AI to teaching. Some of them have to do with how we connect AI to research. So the IT chatbot was originally designed with the idea that we would be able to provide answers to some of the most commonly asked IT help questions. I'm having trouble logging into my email, to how do I sign into Canvas, uh, even to how do I start a Zoom session. There's a lot more that this kind of technology can do. We can expand this out to kind of all aspects of university life. There are some initiatives or there are some projects uh, dealing with uh, how to use AI with uh, the administrative side of CSUN. So the problem we're trying to solve is that there's a lot of stuff we make freshmen do that's really confusing. And this is a way for them to ask a artificial intelligence that has the answers without anybody judging them because the chatbot doesn't care what you know and what you don't know, it's just going to answer the question. So AI Jam uh, was um, a student competition where we invited students to submit projects that dealt with innovation and research. It allowed us to match uh, the faculty interested in the research with the talented students that could actually implement it using the AI tools that they had learned about and learned to use. So what I'm hoping uh, for the future of this initiative here at CSUN is that we can be at the forefront of this revolution. I'm also hoping that we can identify key questions that will help the industry improve their tools. It's not so much about how many products we can put out, it's also about how many meaningful questions we can pose to be able to work on. Thank you, Mariano. So you know what? I am actually going to brag now on behalf of CSUN. And this is absolutely true. So one of my roles, but additional roles on campus, I am the um, uh, faculty lead, quality assurance faculty lead for online and blended um, courses, which is a program with the chancellor's office. And in our monthly system-wide um, meetings, it's always, they always mention that CSUN is ahead of everybody, and I'm totally not lying about this, and there's the oohs and ahs in the chat, and when I present and give and tell them what we're doing at CSUN, they're always really impressed, and we're ahead of every single campus in our system. Okay, so thank you. Okay. So that's it for the presentation part of the faculty presentation, the e-learning um, uh, showcase, but I'm going to turn it to Dion, who's going to talk about AI, artificial intelligence. Yes, thank you, Ken. So I get to close it out with a few words about AI and then some thanks. So uh, we saw a glimpse into the future. It's been a very busy year this past year with regard to our faculty exploration into artificial intelligence. We had a series of brown bags where faculty came in and talked about how AI applies to every single discipline from the arts to the sciences. And even if you can't see it, it has an application. It's pretty exciting. There were a number of guest speakers. So as part of a broader campus initiative, there were speakers here from Facebook. The vice president for Alexa came and spoke. And also a key executive from NVIDIA. I love asking this. Does anybody know what NVIDIA is? You will soon. It's the company that makes the really powerful chips inside the computers that are capable of running AI. So it started out in the gaming industry, 
uh, to run the really powerful uh, rendering of the 3D, and it completely pivoted to head towards AI. So that's how, uh, how important it is. We ended, oh, sorry, we, we also explored the ethical implications of artificial intelligence. So we had a faculty member, Rob Gresses, from the philosophy department lead us through that one. And as you can imagine, that was absolutely riveting. And then we looked at the world of research. And uh, we had Chris, who I see in the back of the room, wave your hand, uh, led us through some of the emerging research opportunities for faculty to explore artificial intelligence, whether it's using it or applying it. And he is actually going to expand that out so for next year. There will be, uh, and even starting over the summer, I believe, an affinity group for faculty who are interested in looking at using AI in their research. So if you're interested, uh, please do connect with, with Chris back there. Next year, what's coming next year? So this field shows no signs of slowing down. So some of you may have heard just yesterday, Google came out and it, uh, at its, uh, one of its big conferences, unveiled uh, a synthetic voice that can now call for you and make a hair appointment or a reservation at a restaurant complete with the ums and the ahs and the thank yous. <laughs> it is indistinguishable from a real human, and so we are very, very close to passing the Turing test, right? So I know it's spooky, but it's coming, and I think it can actually do a lot of good by embracing it rather than shying away from it. Uh, we're going to l take a deeper dive into certain areas, one being research, as I mentioned, another being probably assistive technology, which is very near and dear to CSUN's heart. Um, and, or we might look at the concept of the Internet of Things, i.e. the connected campus. So when you start to have every device can talk to every other single device, you can make some pretty amazing things happen. So it's going to be a, a filled next year. We would love to hear from you. So if you have any ideas uh, that you would like us to explore or explore with us, we would welcome those. So please feel free to email me and we'll put those in the hopper. Um, so that's it for AI. Now I'm going to close this morning session with a few thank yous. So those of you who, you know who you are, let me start with our talented faculty. Where would we be without your innovation and your bravery to pioneer into this new world? So we cannot thank you enough for that. Ken Luna, our incredible master of ceremonies. Ken, take a bow. Thank you, Ken. We have Hillary Kaplowitz and the entire e-learning team. Thank you, Hillary. We have our vice president, Hillary Baker, who works closely with the provost to enable all this. And finally, we have you who could join us here this morning. Where would we be? We couldn't share any of this if it weren't for you, so we thank you all for joining today. So I will now turn it over to Ken. If we have a few moments for some Q&A, I think we'll get to your poll everywhere questions. Yeah, we do have time for a couple of questions. Let me actually, you know, you can tell that this is e-learning because I have a tablet and I have to pull my phone to look at poll ev and see the questions. So give me a second. Um, all right, so the first question is for Amy and Darla. So we're gonna use this great tool, the Catchbox. Um, Amy and Darla, did you find that the open source text material was of similar quality to a traditional textbook? Yes, yes. And we also had the advantage that we were able to use parts of the traditional textbook. But yes, we, we went through that uh, a lot. We, that was a, a prime concern. So yes. Great. Thank you. Um, let's see what else. Sochi. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Has Zoom office hours proven to be easy to navigate for the students and what challenges, if any, have they encountered? It's quite easy. So on Zoom, when you create a meeting, it allows you like three different options. And one of them is you just cut and paste a link mm -hmm. and you put it in an email. And I always tell the students, you can play around with it before we meet. How about that? You know, just five minutes before our meeting, 10 minutes, just uh, play around with it and see, you know, if, if your microphone's working. Because, of course, uh, 
the technology might have some problem. You know, their their phone might not have a good speaker or something. But but in terms of linking with the student, it's very easy. You can email them. You could cut and paste the link. All they have to do is click on it, and you're on. So right. it's 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 very user friendly. I want to say I can vouch for that because it's and, like it cannot be simpler, really. And it's just and. A link. Right, and you know the the video option, of course, is just something that I think um, kicks it up that extra notch. You don't have to use the video, but I find it very useful because I can also see what they're doing. <laughs> you know, I mean, they could be totally ignoring me if they want, but but on the video, um, I can. When the MA student was just going through the paper, and I was saying, "Look, let's use Control Find, and here's the term," and they just were kind of frozen and they couldn't believe that I was doing this from my computer, but they could see everything at the same time. And I was editing their paper and they were just totally blown away. Yeah, no, it's, it's really simple. It's really simple for the students and also for the faculty members. It's really easy to use. And now a lot of faculty members, search and screen committees are using it even you know, for the interviews for when they're you know, hiring tenure track faculty and doing hires. So it's, it's really easy. It's a wonderful tool. I love Zoom. Thanks. Thank you, Sochi. Um, Nancy, oh. this is clearly very helpful for your students, but has it created more work for you? <laughs> uh, yes and no. Um, it's certainly the time that I spend connecting with them, yes, that takes time. But if you connect with them early and often, then you don't have the bigger problems later on. So. Um, Yes, there is an investment, but after all, we are here to help them, right? So I'd much rather be sending them um, congratulatory notes or um, uh, probing them with things that they can do to improve early on rather than having them in my office after they failed an exam and then we're trying to figure out what to do. So um, yes, it, it does take some time, but I think the investment is well worth it. Thank you, Nancy. And I think... Um that's it for now, time's up. So we've concluded our e-learning showcase portion of today's presentation and event. So now I'm gonna turn it over to Christy Michaud, 